Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be going over diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel. Like this video if you haven't done so already. I know we just started, but you're going to love it. So go ahead and press that thumbs up button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Don't forget to press that red notification bell so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released. Don't forget, you can find me almost daily covering a variety of social social a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And I'm now offering next generation NCLEX reviews. I'm offering consultation um, sessions and one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. You can book and reserve your spot for those on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And as always, you can go ahead and grab yourself one or many audio lessons, which can also be found on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, guys, without any further um, delays, let's get started. Take a look. So diverticu diverticula, these are saccular dilations or outpouchings of the mucosa and they that develop in the colon. So let's talk about it. When we see um, diverticula, all that is is a weakness. And usually we find it in like the large intestine. We find it in the colon. And basically it's just a weakness of that GI tract. And so what you have is outpouchings and I'm going to show you what it looks like in a second. But why is it significant? Why do we even care about these weaknesses that cause the outpouching? Well, guess what? Guess what goes through your GI tract? Fecal matter, right? Food that's been digested, turning into, turned into fecal matter that you're about to um, eliminate from your body. Well, instead of being eliminated, if that fecal matter or undigested food gets stuck in that outpouching, outpouching. It just sits there day in and day out and it sits there and it festers and festers and festers. Guess what? It can cause an infection, okay? It can cause an inflammation of that area. And before you know it, the patient's got diverticulitis. Take a look at what diverticulitis is. Diverticulitis, this is inflammation of one or more of the di diverticula. Remember that diverticula is the outpouching, right? But when it gets inflamed, it turns into diverticulitis. This can result in perforation into the peritoneum. Let me tell you something. You see that word perforation? Whenever you see any signs or symptoms of perforation, this is a medical emergency. I want you to think about what's happening here. First of all, our patient had diverticula. They had outpouching, right? Then maybe they had undigested food. Maybe they had fecal matter, matter that just got stuck in that outpouching, right? And it just sat there and festered. And before you knew it, it caused inflammation. Now the patient's got diverticulitis. God forbid that it ruptures. Once it ruptures, that's called what? Perforation. Here's what's happening once there's perforation. You have fecal matter in what is supposed to be a sterile environment, because guess what? Your peritoneum is a sterile environment otherwise, okay? So that by itself will cause what? Sepsis, it, it can cause sepsis. So that whenever there's perforation, that is a medical emergency. The patient's gonna have to go into surgery immediately. Patient's gonna have to be on high dose antibiotics immediately if they're gonna have a chance of survival. All right, let's keep going. Let's talk, let's look at the etiology and the pathophysiology. It says that diverticula may occur anywhere in the GI tract, but most often we're going to see it in the colon. We're going to see it in the, um, it's most common in the left descending sigmoid colon. So even though it can happen anywhere, most often we see it in the colon. They seem to occur at weak points in the intestinal wall. Those weak po points are what causes that outpouching. The main factor thought to contribute to the development of diverticulosis is a lack of dietary fiber intake. Let's stop right there. That's important for you to know. Why? Fiber is the guy that says, come with me. So you're eating all this crap that you shouldn't be eating. Fiber gets into your GI tract and it says, hey, come with me, come with me come with me, come with me, and just pulls everything along as it's going through your GI tract. So when you have a bowel movement, it can be eliminated. So the fact that the person doesn't have much fiber in their diet, that means they're not have, they don't have enough guys saying, come with me. And so all of that crap is just building up. Okay. So it makes sense. Look at what it says. It says inadequate dietary fiber slows the transit time. The way you're supposed to be getting elim the way you're supposed to be eliminating these wastes, it slows down if you're not having enough fiber in your diet. 
let's keep going. It says allowing more water to be absorbed from the stool, making it more difficult to pass through the lumen. Look at the clinical manifestations and complications. What can happen with the diverticulosis or diverticulitis? The majority of patients with diverticulosis have no symptoms. And that makes sense because remember, they've got diverticulosis. They just got that outcouching. It's not like they've got an inflammation. Um, usually they have no symptoms. But those with symptoms, here are the symptoms you're normally going to see. Abdominal pain bloating, flatulence, changes in changes in their bowel habits. In more serious situations, the diverticula may bleed or that diverticula develops into diverticulitis. That's where we have the inflammation. That's where that patient is at high risk for that dreaded word, perforation. The most common signs and symptoms of diverticulitis are acute pain in the left lower quadrant. Remember, most often we see this where in the sigmoid colon. What else? A palpable abdominal mass, nausea, vomiting, systemic symptoms of infection. You need to know what those systemic symptoms of infection are. Fever, increased C-reactive protein. By the way, when you see C-reactive protein go up, that lets you know there's inflammation somewhere. Leukocytosis, those leukocytes type of WBC with a shift to the left. Diagnostic studies. Div diverticular disease can be asymptomatic and usually, like it said earlier, if it's diverticulosis, usually the patient's not going to have symptoms. So it can be symptomatic. It's typically uh, discovered doing a, rut a routine sigmoidoscopy or a colonoscopy. So the person have it and they never know until, you know, they go get to they go get, a, you know, something like a colonoscopy done and it's discovered that they have diverticulosis. Before we move on, I wanted you guys to take a look and see what it kind of looks like. I promised I was going to show you. So here is the colon. Look at this GI tract and look at these outpouching, right? These weakness, these weak pockets. And so anything can get stuck in there and it just sits there and festers and festers and festers and eventually causes inflammation. And that's what turns into diverticulitis. Okay. The preferred, I'm right here, the preferred diagnostic test is a CT scan with oral contrast. Nursing management, again, I put a star next to it and I highlight it because it's important to know high fiber diet, mostly fruits and vegetables. Why? Fruits and vegetables are high in fiber. Okay, a high fiber diet with decreased intake of fat and red meat. That is the best way to prevent diverticular disease. High levels of physical activity. Don't be a couch potato. You're going to teach them to, you know, exercise, to move about. Why? Moving around increases peristalsis. So that decreases the time that that fecal matter or undigested or food uh, uh, stays there or goes into the pocket. So we really want the patient to move around, eat a high fiber diet. In acute diverticulitis, the goal of treatment is to let the colon rest. We want the inflammation to subside. So while that patient is in acute diverticulitis, which means that those pockets are what? They're inflamed. We want that patient to rest. So guess what? They're going to be NPO. We want to rest the bowel. If the patient's hospitalized, the patient is kept on NPO status and IV fluids and antibiotics are given. We do not want perforation to happen. We're going to observe for signs of abscess, so we're going to be looking, we're going to be checking the patient's temperature. We're going to be looking at those WBCs, right? We're going to be looking for signs of abscess, bleeding, bleeding. You better be looking at those RBCs. You better be looking at the H and H. You better be taking, uh, paying attention to the blood pressure. And we're going to be watching out for signs and symptoms of peritonitis. You better be watching out, um, um, if they're having that abdominal pain, if you you know you notice know patients starting to have a, a, a rigid uh, abdominal area, again, you're going to be looking at um, the WBCs. You're going to be looking at their temperature. You're going to monitor the WBC count. You're going to administer analgesics as needed. One more thing I want to show you guys. Take a look at this table. 
it goes over the interprofessional care. The first one, a diagnostic assessment. Of course, you're going to do get a history on your patient. Remember those risk factors, high, high fat, high meat diet, that the patient has a low fiber diet. You know, they're inactive. You're going to get a history, physical exam. You're going to do a physical examination on your patient. You may want to test their stool for occult blood. Maybe they're actually bleeding and we just don't know about it. You want to look at the CBCs. Again, you're going to pay special attention to the RBCs and the H&H. &H. Uh, you may do an abdominal or chest x-ray, but the preferred test, again, for um, this disease, disorder, I should say, is a CT scan with oral contrast. Conservative management. What are we going to do? We're going to teach them about the high fiber diet. We're going to encourage high fiber diet, stool softeners, um, weight reduction if the patient is overweight. What if they've got um, they've got acute diverticulitis going on? Again, they're going to be placed on NPO status because the fact that they have acute diverticulitis, we want to rest that gut. That's number one, and then number two. God forbid it perforates, they're going to have to go to surgery immediately. So we prefer them to be NPO, right? So they're going to be NPO. We're going to put them on antibiotics. We're going to give them IV fluids and we're going to put NG suction on because they're NPO. We need to decompress the stomach. We, and we also don't want that patient to get um, ulcers. So they're definitely going to be on NG suction and you're going to be watching out for signs and symptoms of peritonitis. Guys, that is your diverticulosis and diverticulitis in a nutshell easy peasy lemon squeezy please let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section let me know what you'd like to see me cover next and also tell me the format do you want me to do it in a format like this where it's a lecture i'm teaching out of the book or do you want me to do a kahoot or would you like it in a question and answer format the like the type of videos that are released on sundays 1 p.m eastern standard time so please let me know in the comment section please don't forget to like and subscribe and also check out my website look at the availability I have for my NCLEX reviews, my consultations, and my one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions that I'm now offering. Also, you can grab yourself an audio lesson at nexusnursinginstitute.com. Guys, thank you so much for watching. You guys will catch me on the next video.